Okay, let's get underway. Um, it's my very great pleasure to introduce my friend Simon Penny this afternoon, who will be speaking. Uh, Simon, according to his website, is an assertively, well, I say assertively, Australian practitioner in the fields of digital cultural practices, embodied interaction, and interactive art. Um, his work over the last um, 25 years has included uh, interactive and robotic installations which address critical issues at the intersection of cultural technology, informed by traditions of practice in the arts, including sculpture, video art, installation, and performance and by theoretical research in an active and embodied cognition, ethology, neurology, phenomenology, human-computer interaction, ubiquitous computing, robotics, critical theory, and cultural media studies. Now, as you can see from that kind of list of disciplines, we're talking about a genuinely transdisciplinary scholar here um, who has worked his whole career to bring together perspectives from the arts, from the social sciences, from informatics. He actually has a courtesy appointment in our Department of Informatics um, and the Humanities. Uh, and I, he was the founder of the, I think, a fantastic program, which he might talk about a little bit later, the um, Arts, Computing and Engineering program, which ran for several years at this campus. So he's committed through his artistic practice to working through social, humanistic, theoretical, um, theoretical discourse. Uh, he's recently published uh, this book, which I can't claim to have read because I've only just got it, um, Making Sense, Cognition, Computing, Art and Embodiment. And today he'll be speaking to us, uh, his title seems to have lost from this seed, uh, it's Inactive Performative Perspectives on Cognition. So welcome, Simon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me? Do I have enough volume here? I'm, I, I have the flu, so I'm going to try and... Um, be a little bit careful on my voice. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so, yes, I'm, I'm going to give a, a sort of rapid fire tracy of the talk and then revert to a more conventional um, reading and, uh, and PowerPoint kind of presentation. Practices of the arts, plastic and performing, deal in direct sensorial engagement with the body, with materiality, with spaces, with artifacts and tools, and with other people. <laughs> <coughs> Let's do that again. The practices of the arts, plastic and performing, deal in direct sensorial engagement with the body, with materiality, with spaces, with artifacts and tools and with other people. And this is the perspective that I want to bring to a discussion today that's also focused on the question of computational technologies and human-computer interaction. I have been working at the intersection of the arts and computer science now for 30 years, and I've put a great deal of thought into the kind of problems uh, that I have encountered. So I will say some rather strident things. Conventional explanations of the cognitive dimensions of arts practices and indeed embodied practices in general fail because internalist paradigms provide minimal purchase on embodied and inactive dimensions of cognition. The commitment of computer science establishment to a dualistic ontology of matter and information is an axiomatic belief structure. Matter information dualism, that is hardware software, is a reification of the Cartesian mind-body dualism. Cartesian dualism is ontologically fundamental in Western thought, both in the sciences and in the humanities. There is no scientific validation of the Cartesian dualism. To put it very simply, we believe that we have a mind and a body. We believe there is information-free matter, and we believe there is immaterial information. What empirical or scientific basis do we have for these beliefs? None. What would be the consequences of not believing them? A reconfiguration of the value system of computer science. Computer science, and specifically the subfield of human-computer interaction, 
has encountered and continues to encounter problems in creating smooth, intuitive, and generally applicable applications and interfaces. It's my long-standing conviction that a fundamental reason for these difficulties is this commitment to the Cartesian dualism. Belief in the separation of matter and information is axiomatic in computer science. It's not, I should point out, axiomatic in biology or sociology or some other fields. An axiom is an idea, a principle, which is taken to be fundamental and unassailable. It's a bit Gerdelian. It's a bit religious. Yet, who in this room feels that a deep interrogation of our beliefs regarding how humans are constituted can result in better technologies? Matthew Kirschenbaum once said, if the devil is in the details, then media studies has been positively angelic. <laughs> the, de <laughs> the devil is in the details, but in this case, it's as much in the discursive details. The very language with which you teach and are taught every day reaffirms a value system. Interface, peripheral, implementation detail, input and output, these are not just names. The terminology weaponizes these dumb contraptions for service as actors within an ideological theatre, of which you and I are the rapt audience. So I'm calling for what Philip Agri referred to as a critical technical practice. But we're not dealing with a discourse which is contained within a relatively closed test technical community like plasma physics or steam turbine engineering or archaeological reconstruction. We're dealing with a technology which has become ubiquitous and has become, as J.D. Bolter put it, our paradigmatic technology generally. That means we take metaphors from that technology as meaningful characteristics of our world. In this way, computing has become a kind of Trojan horse for a set of philosophical ideas. We speak of our minds as having processor speeds and storage capacities. We speak of our social exchanges as having bandwidth. A student once told me that a strange experience crashed all her models. The field of computer science does bear responsibility for the promulgation of these conceptions. The origins of the fields of artificial intelligence and cognitive science, for those people who are unaware of the history, are historically linked and geographically co-located. It was largely the same guys. Cognitive science said <coughs> the brain is a computer. Artificial intelligence said intelligence is reasoning on symbols. Each paradigm justifies the other. As long as they both reign, we inhabit a world of illusions. Now, via this Trojan horse effect, digital consumer commodities acculturate pre-literate infants, the poorly educated, non-English speakers, as well as you and I, to keyboards and touchscreen interfaces with all their affordances and constraints, as if they were universally applicable and optimal. Now, I've yet to see a touchscreen interface to a bicycle. <laughs> It's a ridiculous idea. It's just not parsimonious. <coughs> the form of the bicycle is already so ideally matched to the sensorimotoric capabilities of the rider that the design has not changed significantly since the 1860s. Humans have developed all manner of technologies with which they interact with great sensitivity and in a diversity of sensory motor modalities. Take the violin, for instance. An artifact, an acoustic prosthetic refined over generations and centuries, not to enable unskilled or de-skilled use, but to facilitate increasingly sophisticated skill development. What digital interface has ever done that? Children can't read clocks with hands anymore. I don't think this is a disaster, but it does demonstrate that we're rapidly transitioning out of a particular system of mechanical representational metaphors. Knobs and dials, rotary input, radial pointer output, steering wheels and speedometers. Now I know from long experience, there are phenomena you can intuitively, intuitively read from an analog multimeter that are completely opaque on a digital multimeter. 
Let's not be hoodwinked into imagining that alphanumeric display is optimal, even for phenomena we traditionally conceive of in terms of alphanumeric symbols. The born digital are frankly ham-fisted. I know this because I've been teaching shop classes for actually decades. And I see manual dexterity on the rapid decline. Usually, students who show some aptitude have put serious time into playing a traditional musical instrument, violin, guitar, piano. There are downsides to the ubiquity of intuitive low skill <coughs> interfaces. They induce the assumption that if something is not easy, there's something wrong with it. This is a very dangerous expectation now held by an entire generation. On the contrary, it's trivial to, to say that anything worth doing is usually irreducibly difficult. That's why it's worth doing. The incorporation of helpful background calculations into software systems has the effect of hiding basic understandings from students. As I had to explain to an undergraduate engineering student this summer, the, the software saturated educational environment he was in creates an illusion of ability. I told him it was like he'd walked into the 10th floor of a building, thinking he was on the ground floor, and having no idea of how his 10th floor was held up by the floors below. Let me give you an example. I'm building a 30-foot boat right here on campus. I was doing it this morning. This is what it looks like. <laughs> this is what it looked like a year ago. Notice that the hull is made of two long rectangular sheets of plywood. There they are. You can see strings and levels and tape measures and things. Now, in the particular building method we're using, we're sort of building this boat inside out, flexing the sides into shape and then inserting the internal structure. One of the big problems is, how do you know if it's symmetrical? How do you know if the far left quadrant is curved in, the, in space, three-dimensionally, in exactly the same way as the near right quadrant? Especially when you don't have any fixed reference planes, no flat floor. When I asked my mechanical engineering students how to work this out, they were dumbstruck. <laughs> then they went running to their phones and laptops as if they could calculate the answer. <laughs> All they needed was a piece of string, a plumb bob, a bubble level, maybe a square. These are ancient tools for achieving practical tasks like getting buildings to stay up. There they are. They work really well. They don't solve your problems for you but they do work. So the students had no conception of what was required because their education has occurred almost entirely within software environments. Software environments, of course, are simulations, and they're only as good as the people who wrote the software. But notice that these environments are environments in which planes are automatically horizontal or vertical, perfectly parallel or perpendicular, in which surfaces are perfectly flat or perfectly curved, and if required, infinitely thin, in which elevations and angles are automatically knowable and measurements are infinitely precise. In short, a fantasy world. Even if you could build something in that environment, you still don't have the skills of transferring it into actual materiality. So that's my Rant of a pricey. I will now move to the paper proper, bearing in mind the time. I'll speak till three, then we'll have some time for questions, I hope. So, as I said, the practices of the arts, plastic and forming and performing, deal in direct sensorial engagement with the body, with materiality, with artifacts and tools, with spaces and with other people. Conventional explanations of the cognitive dimensions of arts practices have been unsatisfying because internalist paradigms provide few useful tools to discuss embodied dimensions of cognition. Conventional internalist conceptions of cognition can say little which is useful 
about the sensorimotor integrations which are fundamental to action in the world. Practices of the arts epitomize and refine these sensorimotor intelligences to a high degree. In doing so, arts practices implicitly refute the paradigmatic separation of matter and information of mind and body. Thus, internalist paradigms only confuse attempts to discuss intelligent creative practice. This explanatory crisis has hobbled useful discussion of cognition and the arts for much of the last century. Happily, concepts arising from the post-cognitivist paradigms, which have emerged over the last 30 years, provide leverage on intelligent action in the world, which is what artists do. So I'm going to ex explore some ideas associated with these paradigms of cognition, which I call post-cognitivist, situated in active, embodied, and distributed. You're probably familiar with at least some of those. Now, I'm going to give a little bit of a biographical uh, some remarks here. I trained as an artist. Making art with materials and dynamics not traditionally used for making art is hardly a new thing. From the invention of photography, through the development of cinema, radio and recorded music, adaptations of emerging technologies to art is a central trait of modernism. And indeed, the role of the artist inventor has been central in those developments. You may not know that Daguerre, the so-called inventor of photography, was a scene painter for the opera. That Morse, the inventor of telegraphy, was a portrait painter that artists have played a key role in the emergence of major technologies. My own path through this interdisciplinary space at the intersection of art and computer science was designing and building interactive machinery for embodied interaction. Like many of my colleagues in the art and technology movement, I built new technological <coughs> systems and tried to make the technology do things it hadn't been designed for. In the 1980s, as an artist exploring electronic and digital technologies and their associated rhetorics, I struggled with challenges and often assumed that my problems were largely technical, a result of a rather presumptuous idea that I could operate in this realm without an engineering degree. Now, throughout the 1990s, I had the enormous good fortune to be appointed at Carnegie Mellon University as, a as the professor of art and robotics. This put me in connection with world leaders in artificial intelligence, robotics, computer science, and other fields. It was in this context that I realized that my attempts to utilize these emerging technologies to create immediate interactive sensorial aesthetic experience were at odds with the intentions of my colleagues who understood such effects merely as pointers to abstract ideas. So this is a fundamental thing that I realized working in an environment of roboticists and computer scientists, but particularly the AI people, was it? Whereas for an artist, the creation of the experience is the thing. For someone doing a technical demo, it's just a pointer to some abstract conception. And it's the clarity of that abstract conception which is important, not the coherence of the experience of the presentation. So that was one of the first kind of discontinuities I realized. Yet as my familiarity developed and I skilled up, <coughs> it became clear to me that something else was thwarting my project my project was essentially to build intelligently interactive embodied art form in which sensor-based systems behaved in an ongoing but um, uh, op and open-ended way. Now, I was doing this 25 years before games became part of any educational program that I know of. So 
in the CS community, physical manifestations seemed only significant in that they pointed to some abstract verity. The privileging of the abstract over the concrete, the concretely experiential, seemed to me symptomatic of a deeper dualism, one epitomized by the article of faith in computer science, the complementarity of hardware and software. The unremarked Cartesianism of the computing field marginalized embodied experience in a way that insidiously undermined my project. So it was in the context of becoming aware of these deep philosophical issues that I read um, Hubert Dreyfus's What Computers Can't Do, originally published in 1979, a book roundly hated by virtually all computer scientists and artificial intelligence people in particular. But for me, Dreyfus had put his finger adroitly on many of the misgivings I was experiencing. I was a philosophical neophyte, but his writings confirmed that my disquiet was not simply that of a technical newbie overawed by a, Trump tri a triumphant and sophisticated technology. Dreyfus's phenomenological account provided a theoretical framework for me, and I as, and as I bedded into a kind of critical engagement with the philosophical underpinnings of AI, I became uh, aware of the kind of crisis that had been happening in the AI community through most of the 80s and had essentially brought the AI community to its knees by the 19, early 1990s with the collapse of the so-called GoFi or GoFi problem, GoFi standing for good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, around the common sense problem, also sometimes called the framing problem or the symbol grounding problem. Now, in the context of those developments, two things occurred in the AI community and around the AI community. One of them was artificial life, and the other one was the emergence of post-cognitivist paradigms of cognitive science. Both of those movements I, was, I became increasingly involved in, and, and they were very important to me, because both of them were ways of trying to find a way out of the AI cul-de-sac. So people like Lucy Suchman, Jean Lave, David Kirsch, Ed Hutchins emphasised the social and material dimensions of human cognition. And activism grew out of autopoietic biology and uh, entered the world through the work of uh, biologists Francisco Varela and Umberto Maturana and then uh, in, in a book, a well-known book called uh, The Embodied Mind by Varela Evan Thompson and Eleanor Roche. As Umberto Maturana put it, to live is to cognize. Now, this I want to I want to emphasize that this notion that all biological entities cognize is neither human exceptionalist nor is it internalist or cognitivist, right? And this is what I mean by the fact that that biologists and others don't have any problem, don't have the problem of the dualism. That, that computer science and AI as disciplines do have. Now later on, Mark Johnson, George Lakoff, Andy Clark, Michael Wheeler, Ezekiel DiPaolo and others filled out this theoretical area. And Kevin O'Regan, a, a neuro, um, neuroscientist, Rizzolati, Galesi and others at the University of Parma, also neuroscientists, uh, filled out some of the theoretical bases for this new way of thinking about cognition, or these new ways of thinking about cognition. And in the com computer science community, Rodney Brooks and Philip Agri led the charge. So what I was pleased to find out is that these new paradigms of cognition helped me understand the crisis that I'd experienced as someone attempting to make sensorially immediate experiences out of this technology, which at some very deep level wanted to dissociate the living and the material from the abstract. So 
these new paradigms have been very important to me and what I've been engaged in for the last several years is, is an attempt to show how these paradigms can provide us with uh, a new set of discourses for talking about cognition in the arts and cognition in relation to embodied, skilled embodied practices. So I think this, this kind of research is important because it, it, it works in two directions. Firstly, it provides the arts community with a language for speaking about the intelligences of their practices, which have essentially been denied in the cognitivist paradigm, in the internalist paradigm. And this is really important to understand for those of you who are not in that community, that if you imagine that intelligence is primarily or exclusively the manipulation of symbols via quasi-algorithmic reasoning systems in the brain, it doesn't leave much room for being clever with your hands, nor does it give you any explanatory purchase on what that might mean. As a result, e explanations of cognition of the last hundred years emerging out of the Anglo-American analytic philosophical, philosophical tradition have been utterly useless in talking about the cognition of the arts and other kinds of embodied practices. They just don't have the tools. Right? And that's what's important about these new paradigms, is that they provide us with ways of understanding how it is to be intelligently embodied, how it is to be intelligently engaged with prosthetics, which themselves are part of a tradition of development, which may be generations or centuries old, right? Tells us, it helps us understand how we are more intelligent in groups than we are as individuals. Helps us understand how we're more intelligent in structured spaces than we are isolated. Those, that's the importance of these paradigms in my mind. Mr. Page, I've got double, let's see, there we go. Yes, I said all that. Oh, Hubert Dreyfus led this charge. He reminded computer scientists that the special qualities of human intelligence are a result of having a history of human embodiment, and that such a history of embodiment builds brains, minds, and intelligence that we have. His arguments, as Philip Avery pointed out, were not so much rejected as found simply incomprehensible by an AI community locked into a paradigm in which dualism was axiomatic. The idea that things people do are more significant to the extent that they're dematerialized is, I think, a sickness of the academy. And I think we have to be very careful of this because, because as a person who believes very deeply that you can do intelligent things that are material engaged, that bothers me very deeply. I think that there's a um, kind of chauvinism in the academy which privileges the symbolic. And I think I say this somewhere else in the paper, but I'll say it right now. C.P. Snow, as you know, well, you should probably know, wrote a famous paper called The Two Cultures in which he, which he talked about the separation of the humanities and the sciences and how he, he despaired that the two viewpoints would ever meet up or, or find common ground. But in fact, they have common ground because they're both committed to symbolic representation. They're both, com they're both committed to the representation of the world in abstract symbols, right? You might say, that academics, the business of academics is to mine the world and produce symbols. I think in general you can't say that about artists. 
What you can say about artists is that they mine the world and they make more world. <laughs> right? Now, that's <coughs> clearly a discontinuity, a kind of immiscibility there in, in paradigms. Another way of putting that paradigm is, is the way that Andy Pickering puts it in his wonderful book, The Mangle of Practice, which some of you may have read, where he talks about what he calls the representational paradigm and the, the representational idiom and the performative idiom. And he, he contrasts these as two quite different modalities of, of intelligence, or in, of intelligent action. One of them, as I've explained, extracts data from the world into abstract representations. Another one is in the world, interacting with the world uh, in a very, in a set of, very different set of premises. Now, the val this valorization of symbolic abstraction has led to the construction of a false opposition between intelligence and skill. You know, we hear this all the time. Oh, you know, that's not, that's not really intelligence, that's just skill. Would someone like to explain to me the difference? You know, I'd really like to know. <laughs> now, the upshot is that the intelligence of the arts, as I said, is simply inexplicable within the cognitivist paradigm. The cognitivist paradigm, I should explain, for those of you who are going, what is he talking about? OK. All right, there, I've got this slide somewhere. But there's a number of terms which are roughly synonymous. Cognitivism, computationalism, internalism, functionalism. They're all philosophical terms which essentially are attached to the idea that Thinking is reasoning on symbols in an abstract reasoning space. And it doesn't really matter if that abstract reasoning space is a brain or a computer because they're fundamentally the same thing, which of course is a crock. So, the arts are centrally concerned with doing. This is the performative idiom. So we have a real ontological rift between the academic disciplines which are concerned with mining the world for symbols, symbolic representations. I'm speaking in broad strokes today and clearly uh, things are more subtle and there are always examples Oh, which are interesting to discuss. I'm, I'm laying out a framework today. Because I, I mean, as, as soon as I talk about representation, of course, you go, hang on, but aren't paintings representations? Maybe you weren't thinking that, but I was. <laughs> um, so conventional dualistic internalistic conceptions of the world of cognition uh, 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 fail to explain intelligent doing in the world. And the arts specialise in intelligent doing in the world. They negate the pragmatic separation of matter and information, of mind and body, embracing the performative, the processual, the relational, rejecting the atemporal ossification of facts. And there are those key words, mentalism is the other one, that all go to describe this notion of cognition as being essentially a... a, a an operation of, of symbolic operators in some sort of immaterial realm, which is somehow, somehow mysteriously connected with the body. And this was Descartes' crisis, of course. You know, this is the res, res cogitans and the res extensa. And how they fit together has always been a bit of a problem because, of course, it's nonsense. <coughs> Gilbert Ryle. God bless Gilbert Ryle, eh? <laughs> As he noted long ago what artists have always known. He said, when I do something intelligently, I'm doing one thing, not two. My performance has a special procedure or manner, not special antecedents. And what he means by that is that I don't calculate a procedure and then perform it. You know, I'm not a meat robot for the computer. 
our explanation of embodied cognition has to grow out of, has to, has to transcend that dualistic idea that there's intelligence or reasoning in some abstract way and then there's doing stuff. It's just, it's never been right. And the sooner we stop thinking that, I propose, we'll do all sorts of things better. We'll certainly make better interfaces. So there's that idea about reasoning on representations. Yeah, that's a complex set of questions. And this is one of the things that comes up in post-cognitivist uh, discourse, right? Because in an internalist cognitivist paradigm of cognition, thinking is reasoning on representations, right? We sense the world, we construct internal representations in some sorts of mental shorthand, whatever the hell that is, and then we perform logical operations on that, those streams of symbols in some sort of mental shorthand, we calculate outputs and then we do stuff. Right? Now, one of the things that arises out of the post-cognitivist paradigms is the question of whether we need mental representation at all. You know, what if there's no such thing as mental representation? Perhaps that's, we have no proof of it. There's no evidence. We think we see things in our minds. We think we hear voices. But exactly how those representations are constituted and how they constitute something upon which you can compute is, of course, very confusing. So in the post-cognitivist community, there's, a, there's, there's quite a conversation about whether we need representation at all, or whether we need it sometimes, or whether we have it all the time. And if we do have mental representations, what are they? How are they constituted? Because sure as hell, it's not, they're not mental movies in the Cartesian theater, right? with the homunculus sitting in the middle of the third row munching homunculus popcorn. <laughs> because the silliness of that is, it's not explanatory at all. Because what's going on in the homunculus's head? There's another homunculus watching a little theatre. <laughs> and so it goes, like Russian dolls, right? It can't be homunculi all the way down. So even if you resort to the homunculus, explanation, it's not explanatory at all. So how is it we do stuff? Sorry, I think this, this thing's making those noises. If it's not, someone's jumping around upstairs. So I want to back up a little bit and do a little bit more of sort of critical analysis of the, of the underpinnings of AI. Herbert Simon, of course, is, is great, the <coughs> grandfather of well, the godfather of AI. And in his famous book, The Sciences of the Artificial, which you've all read, he establishes the framework for, for functionalist AI saying this. Now I should like to hedge my bets a little. Instead of trying to consider the whole person fully equipped with glands and viscera, I would like to limit my discussion to homo sapiens the thinking person. There he is performing the Cartesian cut right away in front of our eyes and he's doing it unflinchingly and unashamedly and it's outrageous that this became the basis of an entire technological philosophy when it's just so bald-facedly fraudulent. <laughs> I'll tell you what I really think in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, he says, I myself believe that the hypothesis holds even for the whole person, but I'm just not going to go there right now because it's just a bit messy or something, right? Why does he not go there? He not go there because he know his hypothesis will break. Because it's not so much a matter of glands and viscera, they're important, but what about hands and legs and eyes and ears? He doesn't even go there. 
He leaves that shit out. So, now, contrarily, someone like John Hogland, who's a great philosopher who I do recommend to you, argues that you can't make these separations in any principled way. Not only can you not make the brain-body separation in terms of cognition, but you can't make the body-world separation. He does a great thing in this paper called Mind Embodied and Embedded, which I do recommend to you all. He, he plays systems theory against itself in a really clever way. Because he says, if this is a system composed of subsystems, then by definition there are subsystems and what connects the subsystems are interfaces of narrow bandwidth. This is the key to it. It's a brilliant rhetorical device. He says, OK, let's try and find those narrow bandwidth connections between subsystems. And he can't find them. So, if there are no <laughs> narrow bandwidth connections, right, then you've got to conceive of cognition as involving mind, body, world, sociality, artifacts, all mixed up together in a very messy way. And the kind of neat distinctions between hardware and software, or matter and information, simply don't work. And of course, so my, my hypothesis is that we don't slice the cake that way, right? We don't go information, mind, brain, body, hands and eyes, tools, world. We slice it this way. And we say, we can explain cognition with this bit of brain and this bit of body and this bit of world, right? That we we'll slice it vertically rather than horizontally. How can we talk meaningfully about the act of handwriting without referring to hands, eyes, ears, pencil, paper, chairs, tables, light, natural, artificial? You can't, right? Ah, I'll go back to that in a second. Um, so I hope that I've drifted somewhat from my presentation, but I hope that what I'm communicating is that somehow the, if we to, if we look seriously at intelligent embodied practices, we will be forced to think about human cognition differently from the textbook dualistic internalist model that we're so comfortable living with because, let's face it, it's integrated into our, our educational systems, our language, into some religious systems, etc., etc. It's easy to talk about having a mind and a body. <clears throat> but I don't know anymore. I think we should just abandon the use of the word mind. If we stop that, then you know, we might be forced to find some different ways of explaining things to ourselves that made more sense. Right now we kind of lean on a kind of uh, 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 an armature which we've, which, which we've been acculturated to. But as I say, there is not a shred of scientific evidence for the Cartesian dualism. You know, it's just a belief structure. It's all made up. And the problem is that if it's all made up, then the reification of that belief structure in computer science, the hardware-software dualism, is also completely illusory. And if that's completely illusory, then how much of computer science theory is actually well-founded?
I like Tim Ingold. He's a great writer. I think I'll skip this stuff. <laughs> now, but Ed Hutchins, I do want to talk a bit about Ed Hutchins, because he's a very interesting man. You know, one of the founders of Distributed Cognition, wrote a great book called uh, uh, Cognition in the Wild, uh, in which he described the process of navigation on a naval ship's deck uh, at, in computational terms. Interesting. Collaboration of people and instruments. You've probably all read it. It's a fundamental work in, in uh, post-cognitive science. But interestingly, 10 or 15 years later, he came to reassess his own research and realized that he had left out the significance of embodiment, even though he was dealing with, you know, it's kind of an actor network of charts and, and, and instruments and people and procedures and, 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 and uh, these kinds of structures. He says, from the perspective of a formal representation of the task, the means by which the tools are manipulated by the body appear as mere implementation details. And it's this phrase, implementation details, which I think, once again, as I said in my preamble, is so ideologically weaponized, right? Because immediately you say the word implementation, implementation detail, it means I, that doesn't really matter. That's just, you know, an attachment. That's like a, that's why they call them peripherals. Because there's like the sideshow to the main action in the big tent. Yeah, but what if they're not? Right? What if hand-eye coordination is thinking? Right? So, so we've got to be extremely careful of this language. Because it, it, it permits a kind of slippage that's really not intellectually ethical. Now here he's talking about <coughs> what a navigator does in an embodied gesture which is attempting to understand the orientation of the ship with respect to some sort of navigational equipment. The process, and this is when he's talking about when a navigator actually goes, ah, that's the problem. The process that underlie the aha insight remain invisible to a computational perspective in part because the perspective represents everything in a single monomodal or even amodal system. A careful examination of the way a navigator uses his body to engage tools in the setting, however, helps to demystify the discovery process and to explain why and how it happened when it did. The insight was achieved and emerged out of the navigator's bodily engagement with the setting through enacted representations. You can think about what an enacted representation might be. And he goes on, interaction between the body and cultural artifacts <laughs> constitute an important form of thinking. Constitute an important form of thinking. They're not expressions of a form of thinking, they are the thinking, just like Gilbert Ryle said. When I do something intelligently, I'm doing one thing and not two. My actions have an intelligent procedure, not intelligent antecedents. Right? These are not representations or expressions of thinking. They are thinking. These interactions are not taken as indications of invisible mental processes. Rather, they are taken as the thinking processes themselves. Right now, a lot of you people are in HCI and you're concerned with how we work with computers. And of course, because of the intellectual tradition of your discipline, you know, you, you, you. I mean, I guess you think about there's the computer which is manipulating some symbols. And here's the brain, which is manipulating some symbols. And in the middle, there's some stuff going on in the world, which is some sort of a messy communication conduit passing data from one entity to the other. Yeah, well, what if that's completely wrong? 
you know? What if that's just a completely wrong way of understanding the situation? Then what do you do? See, Phil Agri, who's great, makes some really interesting related <coughs> points long ago. He said, computational fields concentrate on the aspects of representation that writing normally captures. As a result, theories which naturally tend to lean on the distinctions that writing captures, theories will naturally tend to lean on distinctions that writing captures, and not on the many distinctions that it doesn't. Right? I think that Phil Agri is the most intelligent analyst of AI thinking that we've had, and I commend his work to you. And that's, there's, a, there's a kind of profundity in the clarity of that observation. Yeah, code is alphanumeric symbols. Writing is alphanumeric symbols. It's easy to mix them up, you know? It's much more difficult to sort of look at a chocolate cake and make comparisons. OK, so this is what I'm saying. We are not minds that happen to have bodies to do their material work. We're bodies that seem to have minds. Right? For far too long, we've been told to imagine that somehow you know, there's some homunculus in the driver's seat of the bodily bus steering this meat robot around, you know, in some sort of meat marionette thing. That's just got to be wrong. So let's grow out of that. Let's, let's be done with that. The dualisms of mind, body and self-world are untenable. The idea that exercise of intelligence considered to be computational must be reconsidered. We must recast cognition as dynamical, relational, and performative doing in the world. And if we do that, then we can ask questions that we couldn't ask in the previous paradigm. Right? We can start to ask questions like, <coughs> if intelligence does not occur entirely locked within the cranium, and if it does not occur exclusively or at all in algorithm, in algorithmic manipulation of immaterial symbols, then what and where is it? OK, this is my summary. We cognize as integrated biological creatures. And any attempt to mechanistically separate faculties into organs and systems can only be understood in the context of an overarching multimodal integration. Intelligence, thinking, cognition is situated and embodied. We think in engagement with the world. In other words, active engagement with the world constitutes thinking. Skill is intelligence. Skill is the traditional, non-scientific descriptor for the capabilities which permit epistemic action and distributed cognition. Abstract cerebration, the mental manipulation of symbols, is a special case. And even then, such thinking leverages and would be impossible without a history of embodiment. Mind and consciousness are epiphenomena of embodied being and have no existence outside of embodied being. And that's, that's so much. Simon. You're most welcome. Um, there are lots of questions, but here's, in the spirit of the sorts of rejection of dualism that is, that, that, that characterized the talk, I want to take you back to this thing that you actually, what you did really, the statement with which you opened, right? That the practices of the arts refute that, you know, the separation between material and information, mind and body, and so forth. And I want to ask you about a different separation there, which is the one of the art. Is it, I mean, it would seem that the, the I mean, the post-cognitive critique would suggest that also the practices of computer science, 
the practices of, right, of, of, um, of, of even the sciences that are committed to the dualism also in practice refute because they do not, they are not conditioned upon a separation because that separation doesn't exist. So I, so I, 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 I can see some like political reasons that you might want to sort of put, push particularly towards the practices of the arts, but that separation itself between the practices of the arts and, and other embodied practices seems a little... No, I, 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 you're right, and I take the question of cognition in the arts specifically because uh, that's the that's the field in which I'm immersed, and and I see it as having suffered substantially from the lack of explanatory capacity of the cognitivist arguments. I agree completely with Andy Pickering, with you, and with Phil Agri. You know that that actual you know AI coding is a kind of artisanal craft. Um, that, that the work in the science laboratory is embodied and enskilled and inactive in all those ways and in, all, in those disciplines, as Pickering rightly points out, there's a, there is imposed a kind of conventionalised separation where the doing in the lab is much more like a kind of like the network theory sort of scenario where accidents happen and one learns from things and, and you know, somebody doesn't turn up for work and you do their job and you realise, etc., etc. Um, and then the extraction of that information into a kind of representational format of a you know, conventional scientific report or whatever. Yes, point taken. No, comp no, no dispute. Yeah, that, that was great, Simon. Um, she partly building on that, you remind me of when I did a course on object-oriented programming several years ago, and I was amazed by the importance of post-it notes <coughs> and the arrangement of post-it notes around the table. I mean, it really was a haptic kind of kind of thing doing the programming. It really wasn't just mentation or even yeah. trying to represent mentation. Right. But I want to ask you a slightly different thing. Um, I mean, part of me thinks, for example, that von Neumann architecture is fundamentally flawed, is fundamentally wrong, um, even though it's built into basically every computer that we have. What um, kind of architecture? Von Neumann. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, von Neumann. Yes. Um, and in a sense, you're arguing that there's something fundamentally wrong with the way in which computers um, are constructed. And on the other hand, I'm thinking of examples. Do you know Ruth West stuff, um, the Atlas and Silico project, um, where she's talking about um, augmented reality relations, relationships with databases, which are based around, you know, you move through the database. As mm -hmm. you move through the mm -hmm. database, music starts happening. Yeah. Um, automatic, you know, symbols, uh, symbolic languages start developing automatically. Um, so you're actually, in a sense, you're re-importing the haptic. Uh, you, sorry, you're re-importing the body. Yes. And you know that that kind of reasoning through databases becomes a bodily practice. So I was wondering. I mean, right. I, you know, are you arguing on the one hand that you know we need to kind of completely unseat um, the current computing technology, or are you saying, well, there is a possibility of allowing for the body. Right. I, you know, thank you. Um, firstly, I have no problem with the von Neumann architecture. It makes a fantastic adding machine. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, computers are computers. And as long as we see them as calculatory devices, you know, they're fantastic at that, everyone knows that. We've got, it's when we pretend that they're thinking. I'm not concerned with the technology itself, I'm concerned with the cognitivist paradigm that says the brain is a computer and the computer's a brain. That's nonsense, right? And certainly you're right. I mean, obviously, on some level, the von Neumann architecture with its, everyone know what the von Neumann architecture is, the kind of input processing, output, serial processing of data, all of those things. Um, that's a particular design of a machine. We have no evidence that, that brains manipulate symbols. We have no, no evidence that brains manipulate symbols according to quasi-logical reasoning systems, except in highly cultured examples. And in fact, we have to remember, right, that what is the computer? The computer is nothing but the automation of some systems of Victorian mathematical logic. 
I mean, George Ball was a slightly strange priest in the 1860s <laughs> who knew nothing about computers, right? But we use, but the, the fundamental procedures of, of, of von Neumann computing involve Boolean algebra. Boolean algebra is a great thing. But don't tell me my brain uses it. Well, yeah, but take the Bull case. I mean, Bull was fundamentally interested in the properties of language. He, I mean, he was interested in the idea of creating a universal language. Right, but he wanted to produce a representational system which was coherent and, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, thanks for the really interesting presentation. Uh, my, my question is really if you could... Uh, address a little better why um, intelligence is the focus of this presentation. And I ask that because um, I'm thinking of Donna Haraway's work, which seems to address the Cartesian dualism of being, uh. or the recent work in affect theory, which seems to try and get away from these dualisms by thinking through being. But you focus the loci on intelligence, so uh. I'm wondering uh, what the method or... I think because I was traumatized by AI. To put it really simple, I mean, my, you know, my particular kind of, is that too, is that, is that, um, I mean, my, my history of engagement with these ideas is in attempting to negotiate my relationship with a, with a kind of alien way of thinking about intelligence. Maybe that's not a very good answer to your question. No, I mean, it's a great answer, actually. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, it kind of makes me think of, like, if we were comparing our brains as to a computer, I feel you could do a similar thing, and maybe they did back hundreds of years ago, comparing it to the pencil, saying that the human brain is symbolized as a pencil because of these things that you can do with it. And so I feel that's kind of the parallel you're talking about here. And it makes me think a lot of learning theory, uh, where computational thinking and computational literacy are important, but it's what is being done in those activities that is what the learning theory is describing. So it's not the computational part that's important, it's the embodiment of all the pieces. So in that, the computer is not how we think, the computer is like, uh, it'd be our hands. It'd be another hand that we use in constructing and making knowledge. And so maybe I think your presentation kind of, I feel like it, it tunes, it should tune into that, that the computer is not necessarily how our brain works, but it is a representation of how our bodies are. Right, well, you bring up two important points, and one of them is this idea that Jay Bolter called paradigmatic technologies. I mean, we as a species that makes technologies find in our technologies not just functional use, but also metaphorical value. So, if you go back to the Enlightenment, you find that the, 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 the metaphors which are used in physics, which are used in biology, which are used in philosophy, are metaphors of clockwork. They're gears and springs and wheels and weights and counterweights and, 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 and for those people, clockwork was explanatory in the way that computing is explanatory for us, right? And presumably in the days of the ancient Greeks, the metaphors that they drew on were metaphors of weaving textiles and throwing pots on wheels, right? The, so, I'm... I think computers are perfectly fine things. I have no problem with computers. What I, I do have a problem with is the way that we have accepted the rather dangerous propaganda that the brain is a computer and all that that entails. And, and as I tried to explain, that's because at the outset of both AI and cognitive science, they came from the same place, right? And their self-reinforcing positions, right? That, that in, the, in the heyday of AI, the, the assumption was that intelligence was reasoning on symbols, that you could capture the inherent qualities of human intelligence in algorithms, in procedures, manipulating symbols 
uh, uh, in serial processing machines. That, and that was the tenet of functionalism, the philosophical idea put forward by Hilary Putnam, which he later recanted. Right? That, in fact, you know, the operation of intelligence was portable. You know, it could be in a brain, it could be in, in integrated circuit chips, it could be in a pond full of amoebas. Didn't matter, right? Well, that idea is probably false, and he accepted as much. So, that's really my, my, my battle, is to, is, is, to, is to critically assess this, this assumption that we're all deeply acculturated to now. That somehow we are computers and that somehow AI is intelligence. And, and neither of those things are true. You sure about the latter? Yeah. <laughs> At the moment. <laughs> all right. At this point, um, I'd like to invite you all to pay attention to your bodies as well as your minds. Um, there is food and drink outside. And um, let's continue the conversation out there. Please don't. Um, oh yes, it's on the reception today. It's on the sixth floor. There's one. There's a different reception going on on the fifth floor. Um, so please just stay outside here um, and um, don't swamp Simon here, but he's um, happy to stay around and talk for a while and please regale yourselves. And let's thank Simon again. Thank you very much. Everyone.